part one. Battle of Little Bighorn. Because social and political climates have affected how scholars and myth makers have viewed the Michigan Cavalry officer, Custer as a leader is hidden behind images in popular culture. Those images are not helped by the fact that scholars who juxtapose the political and cultural ethos of their times with those of a completely different time and place. As I pointed out in another video, the complete destruction of the Seventh Cavalry is a persistent myth that has incredible implications on how we see the Seventh's leadership in the events of June 25th, 1876. Even the National Parks Conservation Association views the battle as a complete annihilation. On the association's website, it reads, and I quote, Deep in south-central Montana, just off Route 212, lies Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, the site where 263 soldiers from the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry fought thousands of Sioux and Cheyenne warriors in June of 1876. 263 reflects the number that died on the battlefield, but six more men died later as a result of their wounds. What's often left out of descriptions of the Battle of Little Bighorn is the fact that 402 troopers and scouts fought in and survived the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The complete annihilation story sold papers in 1876 while it bolstered President Grant's arguments to increase federal funding of the military. Ah, it seems that the Battle of the Little Bighorn had its political uses. Today on the Vantage Point, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. You may recall that Custer had just issued the order to attack. If you haven't seen that video, I'll create a link to it below. Today we'll see that Custer's decision to deploy pincer moves was pivotal. I hope you'll join me. The target of the attack was the sprawling but mostly hidden village tucked away among the cottonwoods that grew along the banks of the Little Bighorn River, or the Greasy Grass as the natives called it. Despite the claims made by his scouts that warriors had found boxes of hardtack and ammunition and would alert the village, months and even years later Sioux warriors and other members of the village, like Kate Bighead, claimed that they didn't even know that the 7th Cavalry was in their neighborhood. Indeed, most of the warriors were sleeping in while others were bathing in the cool waters of the greasy grass, Little Bighorn River. Most of the women were searching for wild turnips and other uh, plants, preparing meals, or were otherwise tending to the little ones when the soldiers attacked at a little past noon. It's also important to point out and remind you that while riding back to the 7th from the crow's nest, Custer understood that he would soon be joined from the south by General Crook's forces. Based on logistics, Custer reasoned that Crook had to be within just a few miles of his location. He also knew that the Little Bighorn Valley would channel any fleeing villagers into the clutches of the Montana and Dakota columns that were marching from the north. There were two major problems, however, with that scenario. First, the true location of Crook's Wyoming Column was unbeknownst to Custer, Terry, and Gibbon. In the 1870s, detached soldiers had to rely on couriers to carry messages from one command to another. The fact that all the columns were mobile increased the difficulties and delays in sending important communication among them. Custer and Terry didn't know that a week earlier, on June 17th, Crook and his 1,100 men were camped out on the Rosebud River less than 40 miles from the crow's nest. How about that? A Cheyenne scouting party led by Little Hawk, Crazy Horse's uncle, discovered the relaxing troopers' location in the small valley. Sitting astride fast ponies, over 1,000 warriors attacked Crook's resting column. After a day-long series of skirmishes, Crook withdrew to Fort Fetterman, Wyoming, where he came from, and the celebratory warriors went back to their village on a small creek that would later be named Reno Creek. Shortly thereafter, the villagers pulled up their teepees and crossed the Little Bighorn or the Greasy Grass, where they set up a new camp along the tree-lined western bank of the Meandering River. 
Although there's no record of Custer discussing Crook's whereabouts, he was a good geographer for his time and most likely thought that Crook would hear the percussions of rifle volleys and rush to the action. Here the golden rule failed his reasoning. Custer's model was to go where he heard shots being fired. Perhaps Crook would have heard the shots and joined in the battle, but he couldn't because he had completely left the field altogether. The news that these Lakota warriors were not the fleeing kind never reached the ears of Terry, Gibbon, or Custer. For all practical purposes, Custer and the 7th were alone on the 25th. That leads us to the second problem. It seems that General Terry and Colonel Gibbon advanced at a much slower pace while taking a much longer and less arduous route. At an officer's call at noon, Custer let the attendees know that he had decided to divide the regiment into three sections to deliver a pincer assault. With 100 plus men and their mules already lagging far behind, Custer's attack force was around 485. Perhaps in keeping to General Terry's order to continue, to continue southward, Custer sent Benteen and three companies, numbering 125, south and west of the Little Bighorn Valley. By doing this, Custer hoped to cut off any fleeing women and children who might make a break for the Wolf Mountains. His immediate command was then down to 385 troopers. At about a mile and a half from the village and near a creek that emptied into the river, the same creek that would later be named for Major Marcus Reno, Custer sent Reno and 140 men across the river to initiate a southerly attack on the village. Based on observations made by Lieutenant Godfrey, it must have been around a quarter to one when Reno left the command. Custer took the remaining 220 men and rode northeast along the ridge that paralleled the meandering river. The general apparently intended to join the attack north of Reno's assault, but for some reason, Reno thought that Custer would follow his path and attack from the south. That made no sense whatsoever. On a high cliff overlooking the river, Custer first laid eyes on the camp that stretched out beyond the western bank. The general could see Reno's attack begin, but more importantly, he saw how large the village was that lay in front of him. Reno's charging and badly outnumbered men were in a dire strait. Reno's tooper, troopers, too, saw Custer waving his hat at them from the cliffs. They decided or assumed that he was cheering them on toward the village, but no one really knows what he was trying to communicate. Soon after, Custer called a halt to his men and ordered Sergeant Daniel Knipe to deliver a message to Captain McDougall, who was leading the pack mules. The message was simple, hurry. At about that time, Captain Benteen and his three companies stopped at a morass so they could water their horses. While watering their mounts, the men could faintly hear shots fired off in the distance to the north. The leisurely manner in which Benteen handled his mount at the watering hole made Captain Thomas Weir, who had less seniority than Benteen, feel restless. Weir decided that it was time to leave the watering hole and head in the direction of the shooting, just like Custer would have done. He and Company D climbed aboard their horses and left Benteen and the other two companies at the morass. Perhaps feeling shame by Weir's departure, Benteen ordered his men to move out in the direction taken by Weir's company. According to Lieutenant Godfrey, it was about 2 p.m. when that happened. And just after Benteen resumed the lead of the three companies, Sergeant Knipe found them. The mules were under McDougal's command, so Benteen sent Knipe on his way. As the sergeant was leaving, some of the men reported hearing Knipe tell Benteen and those around him that we've got them, boys. Godfrey admitted that he thought that the real fighting was over and that they would arrive in time to help the others destroy the confiscated Sioux and Cheyenne property. Not long after Custer sent Knipe on his message carrying mission, he ordered trumpeter John Martin over to his position on the bluff where he was surveying the village off to the west. Custer rapidly barked out an order to the trumpeter that Custer wanted him to deliver to Benteen. Perhaps because John Martin was an Italian immigrant with poor English skills and Custer spoke with haste, Lieutenant William Cook, Custer's adjutant, said, wait, I'll give you a note to take to Captain Benteen. It read, Benteen, come on, big village, be quick. 
bring packs, WW Cook. P.S. Bring packs. Martin delivered the note. He also told Benteen that the last time he saw the general and his troopers, they were heading into or galloping into a coulee that lay behind the ridge in the bluffs that overlooked the river. The shooting off in the distance was not relenting, so at about four miles out from the village, Benteen finally picked up the pace. The shooting that Weir and the other troopers heard since they were at the morass was coming from Reno's attack in the valley. While nipping on a flask of whiskey, Reno led the attack up the valley towards Sitting Bull's Hunt Papa Village. After seeing how large the village was before him and how quickly the warriors fired rifles at them, he abruptly stopped the charge and ordered skirmish lines. Within minutes, warriors had found their ponies and were beginning to attack the troopers' left flank while others infiltrated the cottonwoods that ran along the troopers' right side. One company after another took cover among those same cottonwoods. Despite being among the trees, arrows and bullets tore into the men and their mounts. Reno, who was most likely inebriated at this point, was speaking with bloody knife when a bullet exploded into the Arikara scout's head. His brains, skull fragments, and blood were splattered all over Reno's face. In a panic, the Major lost his blood splattered hat and ordered his troopers to mount and then dismount. Once again, he mounted his horse and yelled out, any of you men who wish to make your escape, follow me. Without ordering a retreating cover fire, the Major broke out of the timbers and rode south as fast as his mount could go toward the ford through which they had crossed some 30 minutes earlier. Of the 140 men that rode into the valley with Reno, only 65 made it through the gauntlet of arrows and bullets unleashed at them as they crossed the river and struggled up the bluff. When Reno and his 65 men reached the top, they discovered that the bluff hid a saucer-shaped depression that offered some protection from the warrior's bullets that were fired at them from down by the river. Shortly thereafter, Benteen and his 125 troopers arrived on site. The Major and the Senior Captain queried each other about Custer's situation. Weeks later, they claimed to have no knowledge of where Custer had gone. It was odd that Custer's whereabouts was not explained by the rapid departure northward of the hundreds, if not thousands, of warriors who had whipped their tails. Why did the warriors not follow the troopers up the hill and finish them off? Shortly after the warriors rode off downstream to the north, rifle fire could be heard from over the lower ridges that lay to the north about a mile and a quarter away. While a number of troopers heard the shooting, Benteen and Reno claimed that they never heard shooting coming from the north or from that direction. At this point, I hope you're wondering, where was Custer? On next week's episode, we'll pick up the story and answer that question. I hope you'll join me. God bless. See you then. Bye-bye.